it, everybody, and welcome to Law and Crime Now. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We have so much to get to. Let's start right now in Idaho with Lori Vallow Daybell. This is the mother who is charged in two separate counties regarding her deceased children. So if you start in Fremont County, uh, she faces bail set at $1 million for felony counts of conspiracy to tamper with evidence with respect to the human remains of her two children, J.J. and Tylee, that were found in her husband's backyard. Now, if you go to Madison County, she faces, she had faced two felony counts. Those were dropped, but she still faces three misdemeanor counts of solicitation, obstruction, and contempt. So a hearing was held to determine, well, should she uh, get that $1 million bail that she was set in that county reduced now the fact that she's only facing these misdemeanor counts? Well, let's see how that happened, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to start right now with the prosecutor and the defense attorney arguing for both sides. Take a look. In addition to the things that have been argued in the previous two bond hearings is my client has been a model inmate. Um, these charges are not of a violent nature. There is no previous criminal record uh, regarding my client in any other jurisdiction that we're aware of. Her, her, her access to funds is extremely limited. Uh, I think the court has issued an order previously uh, outlining that if my client were bailed out or bonded out that, that there were certain restrictions in place that weren't fine with keeping those restrictions. We think ultimately that the million dollar bond isn't um, reflective of the current charges that we'd ask that the court reduce it to $100,000. When the defendant obstructed the investigation into the safety and welfare of J.J. Vallow, she was hiding the location of her dead child. When she attempted to get Melanie Gibb to lie to the police on her behalf, she was attempting to get uh, Miss Gibb to lie about the location of her dead child. And when she refused to comply with a lawful order to produce her children, she did so in an effort to conceal the deaths of her minor children, all while telling family and friends that they were fine. And so, uh, Your Honor, I, those aggravating factors that bear on the likelihood of conviction are, are troubling, they're strong, uh, and quite frankly, they also uh, bear on uh, the defendant's character, which the court is allowed to um, to consider in a bail reduction hearing. Uh, acknowledging these charges are misdemeanors, if the, if the, if the court is so inclined to uh, lower bail, we'd ask that it be no lower than $250,000. And we would ask that the, um, all the current uh, restrictions on bail and her release remain in place. So now it was in the hands of the judge after hearing both of these arguments, here was her decision. In our system of justice, Ms. Daybell is considered innocent until proven guilty. But every court in Idaho, in consideration of what bond should be set, is, is allowed to consider the likelihood of conviction and any mitigating or aggravating factors that may bear on that likelihood. I think it's inescapable that these misdemeanor charges are relating to the whereabouts of her minor children who have now been found deceased. All of the other factors are really no different than where they were when we had this last hearing. I am going to reduce bond based on my consideration of all those factors. I'm going to set bond at $50,000 on each count for a total of $150,000 in bond. If Ms. Daybell does post bond, I'm adding an additional condition to her release that she have no contact whatsoever with her alleged co-conspirators. Okay, a bunch of things to break down there. I uh, want to bring in right now long crime legal analyst Terry Austin, who's been following this case with me. Terry, from a practical reality, doesn't really matter, right? Could have been $1 that it was set at because she's still on $1 million bail uh, for the, the more serious charges in the other county. But what I found interesting is the judge's rationale. It seemed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that she sided with the prosecutor that, yeah, these are misdemeanors, but these are misdemeanors 
that were in an effort to cover up felonies. Judge Mallard is a very deliberate judge. She always takes into account both sides of the argument. And even though it's a misdemeanor and it should be a lower bail, she did take the aggravating circumstances into account. So I think she just wanted to make sure for the record that she stated that before she made her decision. And, Jesse, I think in the back of her mind, she's thinking, I know that Lori Vallow is going to be in jail anyway. So I'll lower it here. She still got the million-dollar bond over in the other county. But the other caveat that if she should get out, no contact with her co-conspirator, no contact with Chad. I found that interesting considering before Chad was arrested, he was having constant contact with Lori, you know, visiting her all the time. Now, I haven't heard anything to suggest that while they're both locked up, that they're somehow communicating, maybe passing messages through lawyers. I know they're represented by lawyers from the same firm, but do you think that was a sign? I mean, what do you, that from the judge that I'm just making sure that you guys are not communicating whatsoever. And is that is that a typical ruling in that case, that you can't have co-defendants or co-accomplices or co-conspirators communicate? I've not seen that before, Jesse. I mean, she can say as a condition that you have to wear a monitor or you have to stay in your house. But they're co-defendants, and until, you know, they are tried, even then, I think saying that they cannot communicate to each other, certainly their lawyers can communicate. So I found that to be a very interesting condition of setting the bond and lowering it to the 150000 that she lowered it to. Terry, we have a preliminary hearing set in August, August 10th and 11th, a trial on these charges for January 2021. And yet, you know what I'm going to ask you. We just had another procedural matter. You wouldn't imagine this would keep going on unless the prosecution maybe had something else. Why go through all this unless they had higher charges? But as of today, Chad and Lori have not been cha charged with murder. Well, I'm going to ask you again. What do you think is going on? I have no idea why the prosecution still has not charged them with murder. They found the bodies. Before they found the bodies, I can understand. And because Idaho maybe, I mean, is it that they can tie Alex Cox, who, if you read the documents, he seemed to, Lori's brother, was so integral in what happened that perhaps he is the one who did it and not them, and they can't tie the daybells? I don't know. But they have to tie the daybells to Alex because they have communications and they have records that they could say that there were telephone calls. So, I mean, I cannot imagine that there isn't anything to tie them and to charge them with conspiracy to commit murder. Yes, Alex might have been the one to pull the trigger, so to speak, but definitely Lori and Chad were involved. It's her brother. He was involved in the other, you know, right. killings as they may be. So I'm very surprised that the prosecution has not brought murder charges as of yet. Well, hopefully we'll learn more during those preliminary hearings, which we plan to broadcast on Law and Crime. But we want to switch gears to another huge case that we've been covering here on Law and Crime now, Ahmad Arbery. Big hearing to talk about for the three defendants who have been charged with the murder of this man out in Atlanta, Georgia. And there was a bunch of motions that were considered here, more specifically towards William Bryan. Again, he's the person who videotaped this encounter that went absolutely uh, viral. Now, the big motion we'll start with is the bond. Was he released? Did he have the same situation as Lori Vallow? Here was the judge's decision when it came to William Bryan. The court reviewed the evidence uh, that was submitted, the exhibits, um, and having considered the evidence presented on the defendant's amended motion for bond, the court will uh, enter a written order. Uh, I'll have to get the written order drafted. Um, the Order of the court is that bond is denied. Okay, I'd like to bring in now civil rights attorney Joe Richardson. Joe, great to have you here on the program. Welcome to Long Crime Now. This Thank was you. interesting, the judge denying the bond here for William Bryant. Did you expect this? And also, if you can explain, how did the judge come to this decision? Well, uh, I think that there are a, a couple of moving parts here, but fundamentally, you start with the notion that, as of now, uh, Brian has the same charges as everyone else does. Uh, while they were—while uh, he was filming, while he didn't pull the trigger, 
Uh, I believe they all have nine felony counts, and so therefore he is a confu he is a an accused murderer. He's not a convicted murderer, but he is an accused murderer. So first of all, not everybody that's accused of murder gets gets uh, bail. And the other thing is that apparently they're doing some investigation. They've they've come up on some information that that thinks that they're they're investigating sex crimes. Uh, for him, apparently, and and nothing has been filed in that regard. And so, at the end of the day, uh, he is considered enough of a flight risk, where uh, the judge didn't want to uh, let him go and and want, didn't want to 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 allow bail. Right. I want to get to the sex crimes a little bit later on in the program. We're going to play the prosecutor uh, actually announcing that, which was a huge revelation. I mean, the GBI had been talking about uh, they announced that they were looking into him for sex crimes. And I guess the question is, how does Brian fare in terms of his case versus the McMichaels? Because he was not one of the people that opened fire. He didn't actually uh, wasn't a part of that. However, it is alleged, Joe, that he used his car to block Arbery in. And I'm curious, Kevin Goff, who's representing him, how is he going to get away? How is he going to ultimately fight against that? Because that's a serious notion here. He's hit with these murder charge, the false imprisonment charge, that his car became a weapon in a way. Well, you know, uh, it is uh, an interesting thing because it does look like his car was used as a weapon. Um, to the extent that this is, you seek some type of influence through media involvement. They didn't get off on the right foot prior to the time when he was arrested. Uh, they they didn't. The attorney didn't look particularly good. Didn't sound particularly good. And I just think it's going to be very very difficult for this defendant to separate himself, even though he didn't pull the trigger. He's there the whole time. He looks like he cuts him off with his vehicle. Um, I think it's just. I think it's just going to be very difficult to play a, a good guy, bad guy kind of thing uh, where uh, a jury will find him less culpable. It's, it's always possible, but um, this is not someone that drove down the street and happened upon this yeah. incident and this issue. He seemed to be connected with him on some level from the beginning. There, there's a lot that we have to talk about when it came to this hearing. So let's take a quick, quick, quick break. We'll be right back right after this. Stay tuned. I've asked you all here today because we need some out-of-the-box ideas to help raise support for this very special place that we all love so much. Shriners Hospitals for Children. They've changed my life, and I know they've changed yours, too. So what have you got? How about a lemonade stand with 19 lemons? And we say, don't be a sourpuss, call today. That's an idea, but I'm pretty sure people would love this adorable blanket as a thank you over lemons. Any other ideas? Ooh, ooh, how about 19 kittens? Please go online and donate meow. Who doesn't love kittens? And Karis and I could fly over them like superheroes. And then space dinosaurs with jetpacks fly in and say, call now before we go extinct. <laughs> Those are all great ideas, but we're missing something. You know, the heart of it all. Caleb, what do you think? I love Schreiner's Hospitals and the doctors and nurses. I just wish everyone knew their small monthly gifts change my life and the lives of all the other children they help every day. Without their monthly support, none of this would be possible. I just think we should say thank you, and we love you. Wow, that's, that's right on, Caleb. When you call or go to lifeshriners.org right now, you'll be helping kids like us continue to get the amazing care only Shriners Hospitals for Children can provide. Please call or go online right now. If operators are busy, please call again or go to lifeshriners.org. You think people are really gift because of these commercials, Alec? I think they will, buddy. I really think they will. Please call or go online right away to give. Thank you.
And welcome back, everybody. We're still talking about the Ahmad Arbery case. All three defendants who have been charged with his murder pled not guilty in court. And William Bryan, one of these men, his bond was denied. A huge motion there, huge uh, uh, loss, I should say, for the defense. Now, when this discussion was happening, this back and forth between the prosecutor and the defense, the prosecutor mentioned something that was very interesting about Mr. Bryan. It was actually confirmed by the GBI that apparently... He is being investigated for sex crimes. Take a look. As indicted, he's facing not just 18 months that speculatively he might be uh, held upon prior to trial. Uh, by my calculation, he's facing potentially life without the possibility of parole, plus at least 27 and a half years. That's a significant amount of time and the most serious charge that could be levied against a defendant in the state of Georgia. Um, there are texts to support the DOJ's investigation. I've revealed this to Mr. Goff, and he knows that we talked about it on the phone. I can confirm as of yesterday that the GBI has opened an additional parallel investigation into sex crimes. So that's a huge development here, Terry. And I guess the question is, and now we understand exactly why the judge uh, denied Bond. I mean, he really could be a flight risk, has so much against him. Sex crimes? How do you think they found this out, and how is that going to affect this case? You know, Roddy Bryan had a very bad day in court. And I think the fact that, you know, he's there for one thing, and these other charges or potential charges come up, and I think they found this information when they were looking at his records and his, you know, house and making sure that they saw what was in the computer. And I'm assuming, I don't know yet, we'll see when the trial occurs that they found this other information. And little did, you know, Goff or Bryant, the, you know, the attorney and his client, little did they know that one thing was going to lead to another. So not a good day in court for them. Joe, it, when you look at this, and I know that the uh, prosecutor also mentioned that there's a consideration whether federal uh, hate crimes charges would be filed as well. The more you put on these defendants is the goal to have them plead guilty and not take this to trial or maybe have Bryant testify against the others? Or is this a case where they don't need anyone to take a deal? They could take it to trial. They don't need anyone to testify against the other. I, I might say that as to the father and son. I think the father and son are more likely to go all the way. I think that if the prosecutor is trying to squeeze one of the three, it would probably be the one that is arguably more distinguishable, uh, that being uh, Mr. Bryan. And so they may be doing that, uh, creating a bunch of, bunch of pressure. And in Bryan's case, it, it may have the potential to be effective because, you know, from a public sentiment standpoint, he might be able to get off, you know, uh, in, in terms of the prosecutor making the presentation that, okay, he's helped us get this conviction. He'll get less time. It'll be 10 years. He didn't pull the trigger. Um, I think it, that, frankly, would be easier to sell to the public because, among other things, the public is really watching on this one. Absolutely. All eyes are on this. And speaking of which, I mean, this hearing had a lot of different components. One of the components was that Kevin Goff, again, who's representing William Bryan, filed a motion saying the current DA, Joyette Holmes, her appointment was illegal. So I want to play this back and forth between the judge and Goff about this motion that he filed that this DA shouldn't be presiding over uh, handling this case. Through briefs, um, it, what I understand this to be, and Mr. Goff, you can address this, I guess, first, is this is the defendant's challenge to Mr. Durden's representation that he had a conflict of interest. In a roundabout way, that would be true, but what this really is, is ascertaining who is the district attorney uh, lawfully prosecuting this case. Our contention is, under Georgia law, that Todd Durden remains the district attorney prosecuting this case. Uh, and if he is the district attorney prosecuting this case, then he should be prosecuting it, not somebody else. Um, well, is, isn't that a question of law? I'm sorry? Isn't that a question of law? Isn't that simply a Mr. Durden, as I understand it? Um, and there's some additional documents that the court receives some notice of as possibly being used in this, uh, this motion here. 
But what I had associated with the motion uh, was Mr. Durden's letter uh, to the Attorney General's office indicating he had, uh, he was recusing. Uh, and that recusal uh, was based upon the fact, as I understand it, from the letter, and I understand nobody's objecting to the authenticity of the letter. No. No objection. So the letter indicates that uh, Mr. Durden uh, was assigned the case through the statute that once he was assigned the case, the case then, my words, not his, morphed into something a little bit different. Uh, it expanded. Uh, it became more than the, uh, the murder investigation, uh, but then also started involving uh, some other, other aspects. And again, from what I understand, simply by reading the letter, he then indicated he didn't have the resources to do that, didn't realize what it was, and because of that, he had to recuse couple of things here. First of all, it should be noted that the judge seemed highly frustrated at Kevin Goff throughout the hearing. I mean, really said to him at one point, this is not a time to be actually trying to defend and present evidence. This is a, a bond hearing and got frustrated with him at different points. But Terry, the other interesting aspect of this, and I found this fascinating uh, because the, pro the prosecutor responded to this and said, the defense can't choose who they want to prosecute this case. Tom Durden recused himself, Joyette Holmes was appointed, and even though the defense filed this motion uh, basically challenging that, they don't have a right here. And the judge seemed to agree he denied the defense's motion with respect to removing the DA or rescinding this appointment. Your thoughts on that? I thought it was fascinating too, Jesse. I watched the entire hearing, and the fact that you could make a motion to not have someone who recused himself because his conflict was the fact that he had no resources. And it doesn't matter what the reason was. He wanted to recuse himself. And the defendant cannot select what particular prosecution they want. I agree with you. The judge was angry with him. And it's because that morning, Goff filed all of these motions that no one had a chance to hear. And if he is a representative for a defendant who had less of a part in a crime, why are you making all of these motions? You are making yourself a bigger part of the case than need be. So I agree with you. It was quite fascinating. Joe, I want to ask you a, another point. Kevin Goff was like the star of this hearing. He spoke so much, was really fighting a lot of different motions here. Uh, I just don't think he did an effective job, or maybe he did. I mean, this is just the situation that he found himself in, because he drafted this memorandum in anticipation of this hearing. And I, I got to tell you, I've read a bunch of briefs in my life, and it took me a while to finally understand what his point was. And his point was, is that the McMichaels were arguably justified in what they did, that they were making a citizen's arrest. Okay, they were making a citizen's arrest, and the, there was probable cause to believe that Ahmad Arbery was engaging in a burglary. They had all the evidence to support that. What they did wasn't wrong. And if what they did wasn't wrong, then William Bryant, my client, did nothing wrong. And that's what's going to be decided when this goes to trial. What do you think about that argument? Wells, uh, building, a, building a house on a pretty shady foundation. Um, to your point earlier, uh, they didn't do the greatest job in court. Uh, and it may be that this defendant is making himself bigger and more of a target than he should. The attorney may be doing things that the client is being insistent that he do. However, sometimes you got to have a discussion with your client and say, look, frankly, we're in this thing. We know we're in this thing. We need to lay low, be in the best position we can uh, so that all of your options are still available. So he really has to pay attention to that uh, and make sure that he doesn't try the case to his detriment before it gets going. Um, that's a bad argument. It's not a particularly well-written document, as I'm understanding. It's not clear where he was going, um, and it's a it's a you know it's a badly written document that doesn't make very good points. And so it's going to be very very difficult uh, for him to uh, to build this house on this shaky foundation. Well, Kevin Goff has received a lot of criticism throughout this case. I can't you know help but remember the CNN interview that he was highly criticized for, where he seemingly uh, insulted or put down his client's intelligence. Terry, another weird point that was brought up in this hearing, it was actually the start of the hearing, was about masks. Yeah. And I don't know if you caught this point, but Kevin Goff actually objected to the wearing of masks 
said it was a political statement. There should be no political statements during the course of this case. The judge said, I agree, there should be no political po political statements, but disagreed on this about masks and overruled this objection. What do you think about that? Well, when I started watching the hearing, I knew what the three motions were about. And when we heard something about masks, I thought to myself, what are we talking about? But apparently, Goff made an objection because Lee Merritt, who represents um, uh, Ahmaud Arbery's family here, was apparently wearing a mask that had Ahmaud Arbery's name on it. And what Goff was trying to say is that court should not be a political statement. This should be, you know, an objective hearing. And what the judge said was, look, I'm objective. You can trust me. I don't care if I see a mask that has a name on it. But I will reserve my right to have a decision on that issue when the trial occurs. So there was a little leeway there as far as Goff's argument was concerned. The judge might decide later that no one can have masks that have political statements on them. I mean, we're just really in the start of this case, so it'll be fascinating to see where it goes and as things pick up with new developments. But we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to focus on another major case, Robert Durst. Big update. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. We're focusing on major developments in huge cases we've been covering. It's time to turn to Robert Durst. So as you know, this is the real estate heir who is, or I should say, was on trial for the murder of his friend Susan Berman, who was shot execution style back December 2000. Now, his trial had begun. We saw a couple of days of testimony, and then all of a sudden, it stopped because of the coronavirus pandemic. That was four months ago. Now, last time we visited Robert Durst in trial, his defense team tried to move for a mistrial and said, we can't start up again. This is totally unfair. What have these jurors been doing? That motion was denied. A few weeks later, the defense tried once again because this trial is scheduled to begin in a few weeks. Or was it? Because this is what the judge said today, Judge Mark Windham, about the mistrial for the defense. Take a look. Um First of all, I do think that the uh, defense briefs are, are, are really uh, outstanding, uh, par particularly as to the, uh, the, the, the research on uh, effects of, of uh, COVID-19. And uh, it's quite an elaborate uh, presentation that I think was well done. And I, I did appreciate a, a good point that I'll acknowledge in the, in the renewed motion for a mistrial. I, I've already uh, let everyone know that ad hominem arguments don't persuade me. The motive behind a motion doesn't matter to me in the slightest. Uh, lawyers may have multiple motives in, in filing motions. It, uh, it's, I think uh, ad hominem is, is a bit uh, unseemly, frankly, and, and uh, I understand why counsel would uh, feel, uh, apparently feel uh, offended by the argument. But it's, it's, the arguments are focused on, are designed to persuade the court, and the court is not persuaded by that sort of, uh, of argument. In any event, I uh, hear, I'm going to deny the motion for a mistrial. I'll tell you why. The uh, defense restates their argument in the renewed motion for a mistrial, first of all, describing the length of delays of previous cases, which were reversed, inappropriate delays. But in each instance, as Mr. Lewin pointed out, in each instance, the initial delay was without good cause. OK, so he denies the mistrial, but he agrees to postpone the case, adjourn the case. Now, there's a status conference set for two weeks from now, but the, the agreement between the judge and the prosecutor and the defense is to ultimately start this trial up again in April 2021. Okay, I'm here with law and crime legal analyst Gene Rossi. Huge development here. Gene, what do you think of the judge's decision here? Because basically what it says is, we're keeping this jury, we're just going to bring them back in about a year. Well, here's the problem with that, because a lot of things can happen between now and when you restart the hearing if you did jury selection now. You may have to revoir dire the panel, find out if they've been influenced by the media, 
if they've developed any prejudices or bias for, either, for or against either side. Uh, it, I, it, <laughs> the COVID pandemic has caused a lot of problems, and picking a jury and maintaining the jury system is one of the casualties, but it's a, it's a natural disaster and there's nothing you can do. I do want to compliment the judge. I love when a judge compliments a party about their written product, even if they don't rule in favor of them. And I love a judge who says, ad hominem attacks, you shouldn't use them and they don't move me. I love judges like that. Well, who doesn't like a little gold star recognition? But I will tell right. you, I'm glad to have you here, Gene, because John Lewin, who's the prosecutor here, raised some great arguments really going after the defense here and saying, this is all a ploy. Take a listen. Just because there is an adjournment does not mean in any way, shape, or form that you get a new jury. And let's be honest, what's going on here is they want a do-over. Let's assume that right now the defense gets their wish and we get, quote, a do-over with a new jury. How on earth are we ever going to be able to pick a jury? Uh, I'm, I have seen some of the and have heard from different people what the proposals are for jury selection. Um, Mr. Chesnoff in his last argument said, well, maybe it'll take an extra month for jury selection. It will take us a year to select a jury. We're going to have to voir dire in tiny amounts. And that doesn't even bring up the idea of how difficult it's going to be, not just the process, but getting jurors who have the ability to serve. Uh, it's going to be nearly impossible to put on a trial like this until the pandemic is completely gone if we are picking a new jury from scratch. Now, thankfully, and again, counsel's motion for adjournment, if granted, in no way puts us in the position where we get a new jury. So our proposal would be that we put this case over until April uh, I think that probably, from what I read at least, that should be after the flu season. Tell the jurors to come back on that date. The court will periodically advise them. Uh, but we keep the same jury and we pick up right where we left off. Now, if when we restart, the defense wants to either reshow opening statements, which were videotaped, they want us to redo the opening statements, we can certainly talk about it. My position would be, Your Honor, that the fairest and most equitable way to do things is if the jury and the court decides, you know what, we need to redo the opening statements, we play them on the machine just as we are playing half the testimony of this case. And we go from that point. Now, if the defense is sincere in their issue that this is about COVID-19, then they should jump at this proposal that I'm making right now. This allows them to be safe, it allows their client to be safe, et cetera. Um, if the response is, well, we can't do that, we're going to be prejudiced, et cetera, then the court has to kind of look behind and say, you know what, is this really only about COVID? And I want to add something else. Um, I want to make sure, Your Honor, that each of the defense attorneys in this case is going to end up signing a declaration under penalty of perjury that they will not be appearing in a courtroom in any case during the interruption of the trial. All right, Gene, there's some statements here we need to address. He says the defense not entitled to a do-over. Getting a new jury would be impossible. Keep, just keep the same jury, pick up where they last left off. And if the defense is so afraid of COVID-19, if that's the only reason they want this uh, case thrown out, then they have to swear that they will not appear in a courtroom. What do you make of those arguments? Well, I don't like the prosecutor's argument. I was a prosecutor for 27 years. I, I, I got the feeling that he was making a, a pretty pointed attack about the motives of the defense attorneys. I got to tell you, if I were representing Robert Dirtz and you had an adjournment from now until April of next year, I would raise holy H-E double hockey sticks that this is not a, this is a violation of my, my client's due process rights, my client's right to a speedy trial. Uh, the prosecutor made arguments. I just don't like um, some of the pointed jabs he was making. He didn't need to do that. He won. He could. He knew he won the battle before he even stood up, because the judge was not going to 
declare a mistrial after picking that jury. No way. You know who also didn't like these accusations? David Chesnoff, who represents Robert Durst. Here was his response. I am, I am surprised that the court continues to countenance these kind of uh, derogatory claims about our intentions here. Um, I, I really would like the court perhaps to make a finding that they believe that what we filed not only has been an effort to provide you with the law, but to try to distinguish in a proper way, the way lawyers do, the case law, that nothing's being done here for the sake of getting a, quote, do-over, but rather is being done based on California Supreme Court precedent that said a mistrial is appropriate in, with a delay like this. It's the first thing we found when we began to research this. The Gray case, in our opinion, is distinguishable. The court may differ with us. But to adopt a differing opinion from us based on this dismissive attitude that Mr. Lewin gives or this ridiculing attitude that somehow we are being disingenuous or we aren't making sense, this is the collective work of a lot of very, very concerned and uh, disciplined minds. I'm not including myself in that. I'm talking about the people that helped prepare all of this work, and I kind of, I, I feel like an obligation to them, considering the amount of effort that's gone into this on almost a daily basis, Your Honor, to stay on top of this, to make sure that Mr. Durst's rights are protected. That said, and we aren't trying to do the case, do the case over, Your Honor, or, or, or do the case so we can be on dateline, Your Honor. We're trying to get a case that, um, uh, at a time that's appropriate, with a jury that is uh, unaffected by um, uh, uh, a, a delay. And most importantly, Your Honor, Gray asked for the delay. In this case, God asked for the delay. We didn't cause this. Joe, I'd like to turn it over to you. What do you make of that response? Because that was a pointed attack at the defense. And number two, do, does the defense have any recourse? Can they appeal the judge's decision because uh, of this of denial of the mistrial and uh, moving for an adjournment? Well, uh, of course, when you're asking for a mistrial, what you're saying is that uh, there's no way your, your right to a, a fair trial is irreparably damaged. And I would say, from the defense standpoint, even though I don't know necessarily know that he's going to win it, um, you know, the idea that a picked jury, I understand the challenges with picking another jury, the prosecution was right about that, but with a picked jury that they would actually stay objective and be in the same position a year from now um, is really uh, something that as a defense attorney, I would be trying uh, to uh, look at all my options related to. Because to be perfectly honest with you, this is not this defendant is not an individual that uh, that has a clean record, as it were. There is much that you do not want to get into evidence related to his past. Um, I don't know that there's any way that the jury doesn't hear about some of these things here or there. You're hoping that they're objective, but there's a lot that a defense attorney would want to keep out in this instance. And so while understood where the prosecution was coming from, um, you know, the defense, I, I would be looking at everything I could possibly do because you've got, you're frozen in time for an entire year, and that is very, very yeah. difficult. Very difficult. Terry, let's go back a few months when this trial was underway. If you take the prosecution stance and say, yeah, the defense wants a do-over, then you have to think, did the defense not do a good job? Were they losing the case? We were at the very beginning of this trial. So would it make sense to you that the defense would want a do-over here? I mean, w were they losing from their defense opening statement? Did they not cross-examine the beginning witnesses the right way? Let's go back to that uh, beginning of the trial. And what do you think? I don't think that the defense was losing. Now, you know, I'm no Durst fan, but I will say, I think Chesnoff, when he read that motion, it was well-researched. And he really had great grounds under, you know, the COVID-19, and, and he cited CDC, he cited World Health Organization. So I think for the prosecution to attack and say that it was, you know, he wanted a do-over isn't fair. He was literally citing case law. And when the judge said, look, no ad hominem and, and, and the papers were really good, I think he was saying, Lewin, 
stop attacking the defense. I think he was saying to Chesnoff, listen, I'm going to rule against you on this renewed motion to have a mistrial, but you filed some good papers. So, no, I don't think he just wants to do over. I think he literally thinks that this is a good situation for a mistrial. So I want to get more into the, the facts of the Durst case, but also I'm, when we come back, I'd like to ask the million-dollar question. What happens if the jurors don't want to come back and they're scared? Can the court force them? We'll talk about it right after this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about how the judge in the Robert Durst case has denied the defense's motion for a mistrial despite a four-month delay in the case and said this trial will resume. The question is when. Well, there, in about two weeks, there's going to be a status conference, but then the judge said on the calendar, April 2021 is when we could see this trial resume with the same jury. Let's listen a little bit to the judge, and you're also going to hear from John Lewin, the prosecutor, talking about some of the complications and things you have to even never even would have considered regarding COVID-19 and regarding this horrible pandemic in terms of a major trial. Take a listen. So April 12th, I presume we would, we would, we would set it here in, in Inglewood because even, even if the conditions ease, I expect we'll still need to maintain social distancing. We will need the space that only this courtroom provides yeah. us. Uh, conditions remain as they are. I've, uh, <clears throat> uh, as far as the, let's see, as far as remote testimony, I've, I've essentially given my, my blessing, but I, I think I need to do more than that. And I, I think now I ought to incorporate by reference the Chief Justice's general orders describing the circumstances of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And I think I will incorporate by reference what both sides have demonstrated uh, quite elaborately in their briefs about the dangers to participants of of uh, being present uh, if, uh, part particularly if a person is um, uh, is uh, vulnerable on account of uh, pre-existing conditions or age. <clears throat> so that part is important. Uh, the second part is whether or not the technology itself appears suitable uh, to the to the court. The third part would be a specific showing as to each witness that these conditions would apply to that uh, witness. Again, I hope to avoid all of this, but uh, but uh, in the event that we need to, to take any remote testimony, I, I do want to see that this technology is satisfactory. Coming into flu season, the position we're going to be in is that if somebody gets the flu. We're probably going to have to treat any flu as if it's COVID yeah. be, because we're not going to know the difference. And because it's almost impossible in a normal flu season that we're not going to have flu going around, it just seems to me that we really need to get us ourselves past this flu season. I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's wise. I, okay. I, I, I... What a world. Now, Gene, as we, uh, they seem to have everything under control. They know what to do. They know how to take precautions. But what happens if the jury, who's supposed to come back, says, I'm nervous. I don't want to risk it. Let's say in a year from now, April, there's still a huge pandemic going on. Can a court force jury members to come in despite this health crisis? A court can do almost anything it wants as long as it doesn't get reversed on appeal. And here's where a court would get reversed on appeal. If you have a juror or an alternate who says, I am scared to death. I'm 65 years old. I have a heart condition. I know I made it through the round of voir dire in the first few rounds of the trial, but I am scared to death that I'm going to catch COVID and die. A, juror, a, a judge can issue a show cause order and find that juror in contempt, but it's going to get overruled by an appellate court. And here's what's probably going to happen. They are going to run out, they are going to run out of alternates absolutely run out of alternates. And once that happens, you're going to have a mistrial. So the prosecutor made a great fire and brimstone defense of going forward, guns blazing. But at the end of the day, 
I think that prosecutor is going to say, you know what? I probably should agree to a mistrial because it is going to be a cluster in April, an absolute cluster. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, Joe, you listen to the prosecutor as uh, Gene said, all guns blazing, let's keep going forward. If you think about the substance of the case, does the prosecution have a strong case here? Because there's no DNA, there's no fingerprints, there's no eyewitnesses, but it does seem to be a strong circumstantial evidence case against Durst, does it not? What do you think about the state's case? I would say it is strong. I think one of the things that's key is that I believe it's under a common scheme or plan. There's going to actually be some evidence allowed on one of the other murders for which he was never tried. And so, um, it, you know, it's going to be very hard for them as they go. This is a very strong circumstantial case. This individual has mob ties. His father was in the mob. He's got all of these particular things that are going on. And some of the things from his past look like they're going to come in. And so, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. A jury could 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 reasonably come up with that and decide that. And so, therefore, uh, the prosecutor knows that uh, they have a good case if they can stay the course. To Gene's point, there are going to be some problems with with uh, uh, jurors and and alternate jurors and and, and things like that. Um, and the prosecution, frankly, will be be fortunate if they get all the way through it without it being mistried, just for the just for the reasons of numbers. I'm curious to see if there's any change between now and when that status conference happens in a couple of weeks. I don't anticipate any difference. But to think about between now and a year from now, who knows what will happen. Terry Austin, Gene Rossi, Joe Richardson, appreciate you all coming on to talk about these important cases with me. I want everyone to have a great weekend and a safe weekend and think about what we discussed today because there are some major legal developments happening in these cases that we've been covering, and you know we're going to have more to talk about. We will see you next week. Stay tuned.